weapon. So God is his prison. Uh, 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 well, that's the thing. That's the thing. God is. Could we simply say I am God? Yeah. Yeah, I can't, I can't accept, I can't accept Christianity on that. I just feel it's unfair on all those innocent babies, on those people. It's not fair on their families. The message of Christianity is not. Whereas with us, it's not guaranteed. No, no, listen. It's not a guarantee we're going to go. Allah, on the Pharaoh, we have, we have Pharaoh's story as well. And God, God's not that baby killers will be forgiven. How can it be all love? It is. How can you turn your life around? Jesus said, Rip. Repent. Repent means to turn. What turn? To turn. What turn? Turn away from sin. How? Turn away from sin. Stop explain, sinning. Explain. Stop sinning. How? By not doing it. Are you, are you, are you not sinning? No, no, but what, what? That's repent. You change direction. But are you sinning every day? Do I ask God to help me? It's covered. But That's what? the thing. If you make Jesus Lord, you say, Lord, you are my he Lord. He just asked you on your last breath. Yeah, yeah, come on. On your last If you breath. confess yeah, yeah. whatever you believe. That's yes. a point of repentance. Will he? That is a point will, of will perfect. He be you are repenting. Hello. Will he yeah, be yeah. under hell or extra heaven? heaven? That's the beauty. That's Is the beauty, it? yes. According to you, yes. your belief. Yes, your last breath. If you say, Lord, forgive me. And Jesus, when he was on the cross, so, I know he said it's not on the cross. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. To the thief on the cross next to him, he, it was his last breath. And I believe that was there. Okay, I believe that okay, was in the Bible. So that everyone can know, let, let, at your atheist? last breath, at your last breath, you can believe Imagine the Lamb of God who takes away the, the sin of the, of the world. When John the Baptist pointed to Jesus. The thief and went he said, to paradise without believing that Jesus. Jesus. You know the thief went to paradise without believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because Jesus just simply says, uh, today you'll be with me in paradise. But this is even before the crucifixion and resurrection. It means you can be saved. It's at the crucifixion, but Jesus hasn't yet died, nor has he risen. Here he is about to die, last breath time. Oh. So it means he yeah. can be saved without belief in death and resurrection of Christ. Well, if you think back, like, how can people mm. be saved before the time of Jesus at all? And that's why I believe the Lamb is so important, because even if you look at the Adam and Eve in the garden, yeah. they sin and they cover themselves with fig leaves. And it was not enough, but God, he provided a sacrifice and he clothed them with skin. At that moment, they had an understanding that God will cover their sin. So all the way through, you know, like, why sacrifice a lamb? To the point to the covering of sin by the blood of the lamb. And you need to, that's, that's the hope. And then the, the lamb came and John the Baptist said, behold, the lamb. There's many the lamb. examples of not people. Not just a lamb, he's the lamb. He's the fulfillment of all those lambs. That's why there's no need for a sacrifice after Jesus. But you know, Christians actually continue to make sacrifices at the temple. So you know, in the book no, no. of Acts, Paul made a sacrifice at yeah, the temple. Yeah, that was because of a, an oath that someone had done. He paid for it. But yeah. there was no sacrifice. But that was for sin. Huh? Because if you look at the details of the oath, yeah. uh, it tells you that you're supposed to make a sin offering. So you know, that, 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 the oath was known as the Nazareth vow. So these men had taken some kind of Nazareth vow and they were coming to the end of that term. And part of the ritual is that you go into the temple and you make some kind of animal sacrifice. But it was never part of the Christian message. Like Paul never said in his letters, make sure you give a sacrifice. So even though yeah. he might have done that, and yeah. he did that to Paul had a different Jews. gospel, by the yeah, way. Yeah, And also he did that to please the Jews, the religious Jews, because he is a missionary. He was a missionary to the Jews. But doesn't Paul so say in Galatians, if I was trying to please men, yeah. then I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. Yeah. So yeah. he contradicted himself in the act by oh, doing oh, the opposite. Doing I don't know about or that. like I having just, circumcised in Timothy. There was one guy, he had his head shaved because of an oath, and he paid mm. for the, whatever the offering was. So I don't know what the offering was. But you know, it's actually in the book of Numbers. So if you go to the oh, book yeah. of Numbers, chapter 6, verse yeah, 10 yeah. and 11, it actually tells you what the oath is. And part of it is some kind of animal sacrifice for sin. Um, and Paul says that Jesus died but according to like, my gospel. Yeah, 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 no, no, no. You're taking one little so thing. So, like, you know, and you're Romans. Applying yeah. it to Christian doctrine, but it's never part of the gospel message to make a sacrifice. But God did tell the Jews to do because he's pointing to the land. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty. So, I'm, I see you're very religious and very observant. No, no, it's cool, and yeah. I imagine you're up early. I mean, Jesus praying. himself was religious. Yeah, uh, he, he, he fulfilled all the religious. Yeah. So I really admire, you know, I know that you have a heart seeking after God, 
and I know you're doing it right, you know, because you want to show your love and adoration to God. And that's a, that's a good place to be. Yeah. Paul was like that. It's very interesting that you pick up Paul, because Paul was uh, religious. And it was when he had a moment on the road to Damascus, and his eyes were open, you know. And he said, I am Jesus. He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting. You know, and that's what you will have. You'll have a, a moment when you go, You are Jesus, who I'm persecuting. But you know, Paul actually never met Jesus. On the road to Damascus. Um, so, how would you make he a said, positive? He said, I encountered Christ as one unnaturally born. So, he did have an encounter with Jesus. He, it was a light, a blinding light. Yeah. And he was couldn't see. How would you make a positive identification? Because, suppose if it was a spirit impersonating Christ, and Paul says, Who are you? and the Spirit says, I am Jesus, and Paul wouldn't know the difference as far as we can tell. Um, and also, you know... I don't know, because after, yeah. three days after, he yeah. was praying and fasting. So he was there, and God came to him in a vision and said, a man called Ananias will come, he will lay his hands on you, and you will gain your sight. So what happened <laughs> three days later, is Ananias did come, because God spoke to Ananias and said, go to Paul, go to Saul, who is in a house, he told him the address, so like that's a supernatural intervention. And he said, he is praying. And pray for him. So that's what Ananias did, he went to pray. And the guy is blind. So he's like, God, you know, you appeared to me, you said I'm, you know, uh, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. And Ananias says, I've come, I've come. And God is going to use you. Yeah, and from that moment, I mean, it must have been a revelation. You think Paul, um, Paul was str sort of struggling. He had conscience in his heart, and he's like, he start, I, I know I need to do this as a religious person, but my heart is pulling me in a different direction. And I think that's what everyone who is religious has to go through. You know, they kind of struggle. There's a struggle like, I love God, but, you know, this is my tradition. This is my... Uh, you know what I've been brought up in, and that's what that's what we're seeing. But you know the Anaya's vision. There's two different versions of the story. Hey, Damien. Um, so there's two versions. So in one version, Jesus actually spells out the details as to what Paul is to do, what his mission is. But in another version of the same story, um, Jesus tells him to go and meet Anaya's, and Anaya's will inform him. So um, one is in Acts chapter nine. Um, and there's another version in Acts chapter 21. Oh, right. um, and there's another third version as well, which I don't remember the reference to my band. Yeah, and then An Ananias will instruct him and give him the full details. Oh, it might be not after, um, after he got his sight back. Probably. Well, probably it, after he got his sight back. Well, even like those that were with him, in one version, uh, they see the light, but they don't hear oh, yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. But in another version, they hear the voice, but they don't see anything. Uh, so there's different... Because I, I know the one where they were here, they saw the light, but didn't hear the voice, yeah. So, uh, like, if you go to Acts... Which uh, version of the Bible do you use? Uh, it's just the ESV, English oh, Standard ESV Version, version yeah. yeah. Um, um, so it's just uh, in Acts chapter 9. Yeah. Um, Uh, so it's uh, just Paul's conversion. Um, as he went to Damascus, a voice say, "So, so, why are you persecuting me?" Um, and he says, "Who are you, Lord?" And he says, "I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do." Um, the men who travelled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. So in this version, uh, they hear the voice. Uh, but they don't see anything. Um, so in, in another version, um, in Acts, I think it's Acts 21. So not Acts 21. Um, on the way near to Damascus, to the ground. So, so why are you persecuting me? So Acts 22. Um, yeah, so it's the same uh, I am Jesus. Now those who are with me saw the light but didn't understand the, vo uh, the voice of the one who was speaking so, to me. I mean, the ESV uses understand, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe that's, they heard the voice but didn't understand it. 
So what's the second one? Acts 21? Um, the second one, Acts 22. Um, so. What's the verse? Um, sorry, let me just look it up. Sorry, Acts chapter 26. Got the one, the second one, yeah, without. So, <coughs> th th there's a third one as well. No, what, um, was the, what was the middle one? Um, Acts chapter 22, uh, verses 6 to 20, 21. Because what I find happens uh, is if you look at the understanding of what it is, it becomes clear. Oh yeah, so it's Acts 22, Acts 28, 22. They, so okay, but they did not hear. So ekusan, that sounds like French, doesn't it? Oh cool, you know Greek. I don't know, I've got it here. Oh, it's oh sorry, okay. So they did not hear, listen, comprehend uh, properly to hear, to hear God's voice. I don't know. So there was something missing in the way they heard it. Maybe they didn't understand. Mm. I mean, the ESV use understand. Okay. So maybe they didn't understand it. But the first time, in the first one, they understood, they heard it, right? Oh, uh, they, they saw the light, but they didn't hear anything. The first one? Yes, yeah, so Acts chapter 9. Um, the men who were travelling with him stood speeching, hearing the voice. Oh, oh sorry, but they didn't. Uh, but so see, they, see like no it. one. It's like they okay. heard it, but they didn't understand it. I suppose you know. So, however, Jesus spoke to Saul. It was in directly to him, wasn't it? It's like when you're round here, you don't. You can hear people, but you can't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. What's your, what's your name? Oh, uh, Naz. Naz. Yeah, Naz. yeah. Naz is yeah. Naz. Was I talking to Naz? Uh, his name is also Naz as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, my full name is Nasam. Yeah, but uh, Naz is more easy to remember. Yeah, so, yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it's yeah. really cool. It's, it's really, really good. I love it. What is it about? And what's the third? There's an up. We were saying about um, when Jesus appeared to Saul. He heard a voice, and then Naz was showing that other people heard the voice. But later, when Saul is explaining it, he says they didn't. And the, and the word could be translated here, but it could also be translated understand. So, you know, we're just kind of examining some of those details. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry, this is the third one. Um, oh, yeah. Acts chapter 26. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's verses 12 to 18. Okay, Saul, so, Saul, so, why are you persecuting me? Yeah, yeah. Says, who are you? And says, I am Jesus, but rise. Stand upon your feet for I have appeared to you for this yeah, purpose yeah. to appoint you and so on. So you know like in this version, oh, Jesus right, okay, okay. gives the... So he says all of this, Yeah. Well, at that moment, so it's also why you're posting me, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Yeah, that happened there, but rise and stand on your feet. So he may, yeah, it looks like he said that as well, yeah, at that moment. So, so, so you know... he's saying in, go into the, go into the... Well, in Acts chapter 9, he goes and tells to meet Anias, and, and Anias yeah. will explain to you or yeah, something. Yeah. Um, in, in this version, it doesn't mention the ones that were travelling with him. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's okay. It's I mean, you know, God spoke to him personally, didn't he? Um, but w what I really just wanted to show you was um, that um, Paul um, preached um, uh, uh, another gospel to the, that of James and the disciples? Nah. <laughs> no, he doesn't. He just says it's my gospel. Like it's his, you know, he he possesses the gospel. You know, he, he says to the Galatians, "I'm astonished. What made no, no, you turn says, away he, to he another says, gospel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He the says, one I like, left you if with." If anyone believes that a gospel other than this one made it be cursed, so it's not like a, his gospel and his gospel. It's all the same. So do you know, like as a Gentile believer in Jesus. You're supposed to abstain from, mo um, 
food that has been sacrificed to an idol or from blood or from dead animals. Um, so, but Paul says you can basically eat food that has been offered to an idol. But Paul... It was a letter of advice. So from the elders, it was saying yeah. sexual immorality, actually. You forgot that one. That was the other thing, Which yeah. Which is really important. That is a really important thing to say. Because they, they were in this position where the Jews, or they wanted... There was these kind of religious Christians, and they wanted to make the new Christians into Jews. So what that would have done, it wouldn't have been the gospel. What it would have been would be like become legal, legal, a, a, a kind of like the Pharisees, you know. <laughs> but what's the point in the gospel? But what God wants, He wants our hearts. So He wants us to love Him, and He wants us. He He, he wants us to. Uh, kind of obey him, but from our hearts, not the letter of the law. And this is, you know, Christianity is a, is a, it's, it's kind of based on free will. Like, oh, someone's Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, God doesn't, yeah, it's not course, gonna, yeah. it, we're not robots. God we, wants a relationship. Like, he doesn't really want to force yeah, you. He wants you to want him. Yeah. And he wants you, like the Pharisees, they're all about legalism and law. And, you know, they, they wanted everyone to follow every single letter of the law. And that's very difficult to do. And you all, what the problem with legalism is if you don't do it, you feel guilty. And, and um, you never get peace. Because you, if, the more you try, the more you fail. You know? And a lot of Christian... Some of the big names in Christianity, uh, like Martin Luther and John Wesley, you know, they heard those names. They all tried being a religious, a dedicated mm. religious person, but and it didn't work for them. And they said they have a moment where they realise that it's by grace they're forgiven. And the thing is, when you understand that you're forgiven, it gives you power to overcome sin. Instead of going around in this in this cycle of guilt and then trying, because the more it's like the more you try, the harder it is. You know, if you're trying to be good, it becomes hard. But if yeah, you're just you trying like, to keep good company, yeah, and the, the, uh, people that will yeah, remind yeah. you. And the Bible says, like we are dead to sin. Count yourselves dead to sin, which means like it's cancelled. And mm. suddenly, when that's the case, you. It gives you a kind of power over temptation because you know it doesn't count anymore. So the only thing that you're dealing with is like, what's that sin going to do to me? You know, and then you go, like, well, I don't want sin. It's, it's, instead of it being this kind of continual guilt cycle, you become like thankful. To God. I mean, have you ever been baptized? Yeah, yeah. So like, even we, like, we practice baptism like every day, like before oh, we yeah, pray. Yeah, yeah. Have like a mini baptism as well. So that's kind of like a purification ritual where we kind of wash ourselves of our like, bad deeds but also we perform the prayer. Yeah, well the thing with Christian a, baptism yeah. is, it, is it's an identification with Christ and that's why it only needs to be done once because you are identifying with Christ. You're saying, and that's why baptism is important because that is a moment where you declare openly to spiritual and physical powers, I am dead to my old life and I'm alive with Christ. I'm, my old life is buried in baptism and I'm a new creation. So that's why Paul, Saul, when he, uh, he is baptised, it's the first thing that happens. Ananias prays for him oh, okay. and he's baptised. So that's a new, a declaration of a new life with Jesus starts really with baptism and that's why a lot of people are baptised uh, kind of quite early in their journey. And nowadays, people sometimes say do a couple of weeks, learn a bit about the Bible. But really, baptism can be done immediately. You don't need to be good enough to be baptised. You can be baptised like, right as soon as you decide Jesus is your Lord. And the other thing is, when you become a Christian, you, the Holy Spirit is very important because we receive the Holy Spirit so that the power of God and the presence of God can begin to work in our hearts. And what we find is that the Holy Spirit teaches us and leads us into all truth. So we begin to find sin exposed in our lives. Like the Holy Spirit will help us and he'll say, turn away from this. But he's very gentle. And but yeah, if also if you study the word as well, that helps you to understand what sin is and, yeah. and identify it and stay away from it as well. 
So, you know, one of the most important commandments is that you should have one God, uh, you know, the God who took Israel out of Egypt, and you should only worship Him and serve Him only. Um, so, not to associate partners with God, not to say that God is like a man or like anything that is uh, um, that walks on the earth or anything that is in the sky or beneath the sea. Um, that God is nothing that we can imagine but he's also worthy of our worship um, and to submit to him uh, just like Jesus did uh, he submitted his will to God yeah. and also the disciples worship Jesus so when he calmed the storm they worshipped him this is and when he was risen yeah. from the dead they worshipped him and Jesus didn't and even Thomas he said my Lord and my God you know there is this adoration of Jesus which was in many people's eyes blasphemous and the, the Pharisees were so jealous of Jesus because he was receiving the adoration of the people. Like when he went into Jerusalem, they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So there is this, this struggle, you know, like with the religious, they say, how can you worship Jesus? But he's the word of God, you know, he's the yeah. image of God. But, but you know, this isn't the same type of worship that God receives in the New Testament. Because God receives religious, cultic worship. Whereas Jesus receives our uh, homage and uh, homage and respect, so, so Jesus, like as God's representative, his Messiah, um, he receives honor. So just like in the Old Testament, King David, he receives worship. Um, like in the Book of Chronicles, chapter 29, verse 20, and even Joseph as well, when he's in a position of power, uh, to fill that dream. Yeah. Uh, so this is a religious worship by Actually, well. the, the reason why the reason why the Pharisees wanted to stone please, Jesus please, is because it's I and the Father are one. And when he said that, the Pharisees picked up stones to stone him. So when you want to see like when did Jesus say he was God? Look at when the Pharisees wanted to kill him. Whenever the Pharisees wanted to kill him, that's when he was saying he was God. So when he said I and the Father are one, they wanted to stone him. When he yeah he's when he forgave sins they said who can forgive sins except God alone? You know, there's kind of clear but, points. But when Jesus said that, who can forgive sin but not, uh, but God alone, and so that you may know yeah, yeah. the Son of Man has authority on earth to say your sins are forgiven. There they didn't want to stone him. And even uh, when Jesus asked yeah. the disciples, who do men say that oh, yeah, I yeah. am? Um, they say, you are you are one of the yeah, prophets, yeah. Uh, or you yeah, are yeah. the Messiah, who the Christ. Say, yeah. The Messiah. So, so, like, there are some... But in, in John, I am the Father of one. That, uh, biblically speaking, when you say you're one, it can mean one in purpose. Because Paul says about Apollos that are uh, in First Corinthians chapter three that I planted the, the the church and you watered it and nurtured it. So myself and Apollos are one. Yeah. So so if you look at um, you know like the verse that I mean about Apollos, yeah, 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 Paul and Apollos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you look at scripture like Isaiah nine verse six. Okay, what does that say? It says that he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Oh, okay. And it's a messianic prophecy. So there's the Lord himself will bear their sins. You know, there, there are some clear scriptures which show that the Messiah is the Lord. You know, and it is, it is like a real... You have to really understand, like, well, how on earth can this happen? But, like, Jesus is, is called Emmanuel, God with us. But that, for me, is a really good scripture. I'll show you that one. Yeah, he Isaiah. shall be... Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's really, really important. Isaiah chapter 7. 9 verse 6. Okay. Chapter 7 is also a good one yeah, as well. Yeah. So... Unto for, us a child is born. Yeah. Um, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And the government shall be on his shoulders. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. So... For me, that's kind of clear. I mean, whether you might say, oh, he was just going to be called Mighty God. Um, but for me... Mighty God is a title that's used for the judges of Israel. So in Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 33, verse 20, um, the same word, the root word, is also used for the judges of Israel. Um, and also Moses is called Elohim. Um, they, Solomon is called Elohim. The angels are called Elohim. So biblically, someone could be called God, who's in a position of power and authority. You know, you know that word, son of son of man. Yeah. Have you you know about the reference to that in Daniel? Yeah. 
boys Almighty God. So that it is, it is like a. Yeah. That's, that's a, a distinction. It, because why yeah. not? Did Jesus keep calling himself the Son of Man? Isn't everyone a Son of Man? But yeah. he's referring to. Sometimes he calls himself the Son of Man. Yeah. Sometimes, but sometimes he prophesizes about the Son of Man to come. Yeah. So, so, so well, sometimes the Son of Man refers to someone else. Yeah, sure. um, so well, like when you, you it, imagine, right? yeah. you imagine like Jesus comes in the, in the flesh and mm. he is there, and people are like, if he comes and he says like, guys, I'm God. Yeah. How how on earth can people comprehend that? Well, they they they're, they're how told can, to how stone. Can people, yeah. How can people like in their mind they kind of go mad mm. because like that's just so hard to compute but you have to say what how does God show himself mm. how could God show us who he is mm. really how can we know who God is well, and you, God, you God, might say yeah. we can never know but I say we know because Jesus shows us the Father. And for me, like, that is the miracle. That yeah. is where... He shows us the yeah, Father, yeah. but he's not the Father himself. He says, I am the Father of one, but he's yeah. the Son. Yeah. But he is God. And, like, that helps you understand. If you're, like, you know, going through the scriptures and you're saying, you know, prove it, prove it, prove it. Yeah, okay, well, I'm, there are scriptures. So, I mean, I'll just show you a couple. Um, and Thomas says, my Lord and my God. Okay. You know, when Jesus appears, he says, I won't, I, won't, I won't believe unless I see the nails. And uh, then Jesus comes, he says, stop doubting, believe. You know, like there is an element of faith. And I think the fact, the reason why, it's not all through the scripture, like Jesus is God, Jesus is God, Jesus is God. Because it is a step of faith. It's a step of faith for you. And it was a step of faith for Thomas. Like, and Philip says as well, he says, how can we know But is he so calling Jesus God? God in the same way Moses is called God unto Pharaoh? Or in the same way that Solomon is called God in you know in Psalms uh, 46 verse 5. Um, so could Thomas also be called calling Jesus my Lord and my God? Yeah, yeah. In the same way that Moses is called God. Mm. Uh, and also he tells Mary Magdalene a few verses earlier, to touch me not, for I've not yet ascended yeah, yeah, to my God yeah, and yeah. to your God, to my father and your father. Yeah, yeah. So he had a God. And what was the God of Jesus like? Was it Father, Son and Holy Spirit or was it just the Father? Yeah, because he was fully human. That's the amazing thing. So in his, in his human nature, he is worshipping God. You know, he's praying to God. That's how Jesus came because he became fully human. Mm. Put on flesh. But if he was praying to God, it means he was praying to himself. But obviously that Father. didn't happen. Well, his human nature is mm. praying to God. So he's fully so human. The human nature is it praying to God the Son? I don't know. He's praying to the Father. Yeah. Uh, it's so difficult. always it's in the Bible when he prays, it's always to the Father. Right. Yeah, yeah. Why not? Uh, and because, even he yeah, says no, because the thing what Jesus is doing, he's he's achieving two things. He's achieving redemption, but he's also being the light. So he redeemed us, and the only person who can redeem us is God. We can't redeem ourselves. We need a redeemer. We need a pure lamb, and the only person that can be pure is God. And the other thing he's doing is he's showing us how to relate to the Father. Mm. So the disciples say to him, teach us to pray. And Jesus, because he's fully human, he can teach us to pray. Mm. He says, okay, our Father. Yeah, not our Son, yeah, yeah. who art in yeah, heaven. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah, or not or our Holy Spirit. Yeah, but he's it's more, only the Father. From his human nature, he's it's it's monotheism. Yeah. It, yeah. It's monotheism, but directed to the Father. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Father is the one true God. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really good. I love your questions. They're really good. No, and I know yeah. they're like, good for integrity. You're not like just... I, I take it you've got some Muslim families like on your wife's side. Well, they're, yeah, I mean, they're not strict Muslims. But oh, okay. they, she grew up actually in the Soviet Union oh, in, in Azerbaijan. So she grew up as an atheist. Oh, but okay. her grandmother was a kind of devout person. Did you get to experience a bit of Ramadan or...? Or Islam. Um, in her family, there would have yeah. been, yeah. So, yeah, it would have been some of that. What? Um, yeah. Uh, I've never been there before. Oh, okay. Speaking of yeah. It's great. I love you it. You should come back. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so cool.
it's such a good atmosphere. Like, I'm so happy to be here. It's really yeah, nice. Yeah. Like, really good questions. We really need more people like you, so. Yeah. yeah, I know. I hate it when people are like violent. You know, like even Christians can be really annoying, and you can't have a discussion. Like, I've had like four really good discussions today. Oh, really? With Ahmed, that was really nice. Oh, cool. And then uh, he was a bit funny. He was trying to hit me. You know, kind of. He was getting a bit violent, but. It's been a good good experience. So you, I forgot your name. David. David, yeah. Okay, I'm Naz. Cool. Good talking to you, yeah. Peace. Peace. I admire your uh, study of the Bible. Thank you, yeah. I'm still learning, so yeah. What's that? I'm still learning, so I can. Yeah, it's great. It's really interesting that you picked like Saul as well. Like that mm. scripture seems to like speak to you. Which one? Well, about Saul, like the character and the yeah. personality of Saul. Because there's a lot you, I suppose, you can probably relate to, you know, with Saul. Because he was, he was a strict oh, Pharisee. Yeah. But somehow he's still got that. Mm. He's trying to do the will of God. Definitely. Yeah, anyway. Good to talk. Oh, okay. Nice. Thank I hope we see yeah. you again. Yeah, I hope we can pick again, yeah. Lovely. You can sit down. Yeah, if, if I can do your would you... When they stand up for themselves, they call them penalties. Thank you. When they stand up for themselves, they How's the uh, campaign going? Okay, okay, yeah. It's going in the right direction, upwards in the polls. Cool. Still got a long way to go. Yeah, I think reform will do, probably will do I, good. I think so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Whether we'll get seats or how many, I don't know. But I think we're going to get a lot of votes. A lot of second places. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. It's going to be between um, Labour and Reform. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping the independents do well. There are a lot. So, like, if where I yeah, am, there's, there's a saturation. There's, yeah. there's 12 candidates in total, and I think four or five independents. Really? Oh, okay. I don't know how well George Galloway's Workers' Party will do as well. They might do. Mm. Okay. The problem with the Galloway's Party is that. A lot of independence, so they're ending up yes. dividing or splitting the vote. Um, um, I don't know what reforms view on Palestine or on Israel. We and don't Gaza. really have a no, position yeah. on it. I think we try and keep out of it, to be honest. Did you see any uh, bread or anybody? How are you doing? Um, not recently, no. I think they may have gone. Oh, um, I haven't seen them. I think everybody leaves early now. Yeah. Hey, oh hi, yeah. yeah, yeah I know. That once hey, before, you yeah. About subordinationism. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Because one thing I noticed is that subordination is quite common between within the early church fathers. So. Yeah, that yeah. seems to be like the earliest view, like even in the yeah. New Testament. Oh, uh, yeah. Did yeah. the, 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 the they fall in the category of adultery? Sorry? Did they fall in the category of adultery? Subordinism. Yeah. It's a good question. I'm not really sure to go. R remind me what is subordinism again? Because it's been a. Yeah, the idea that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit aren't identical in essence, and there is hierarchy in essence. So there's some things the Father can do that the Son can't, and there are things the Son can do that the Holy Spirit can't. So, that, so, so the Holy Spirit would be, say, limited and not the same message as the Father. You know? I thought, yeah, subordinism is like where the Son is subject yeah. to, to God, basically. Yeah. So, so that isn't shirk, like if you regard Jesus as a servant, uh, then that's not shirk. Um, that's what we believe in as well. Um, the, you know the first words that Jesus seems to utter in the Quran is that I am a servant of God. Uh, so when Mary brings Jesus back to her people, Jesus says, um, Verily I am a servant of God. Um, God has made me a prophet and he's given me scripture. Yeah, so, kind of, yeah. Oh, yeah. kind of put things together, isn't it? But yeah, one thing that's true is that the early church isn't so... It's not so uniform on the view of the Trinity. So I don't think there are any Trinitarian church fathers before you, you, Nicaea. Yeah, you, you get the ideas of it. For example, Clement of Rome will talk about the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. But what does this mean? You know, that's the question. Like, oh yeah, but even Matthew speaks about yeah. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Yeah. But it doesn't mean he was a Trinitarian. The, the divinity of them is very clear. The idea of divinity with the Father, Father Son and Holy Spirit is very obvious. Okay. And the, the, idea of, the idea of essence is not so obvious. So Origen, yeah. Eusebius, these heretics, you know, 
it's not that bad in that sense. It does seem many of them were subordinates, like um, or, or, or Oregon and Tertullian as well. Because they interpret some of the verses to mean that Jesus is representing God rather than identifying as God. So like uh, when Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father in John, um, I believe Tertullian, uh, he interpreted that to mean that Jesus is claiming to be a representative of God. I haven't read Tertullian, then, oh, okay. I'll probably get around to it. It's just, I've, I saw Origin, I read Origin, and I oh, realised okay. that maybe it's not as obvious as we think it is. Yeah, but, I don't think yeah. Origin was at a Trinitarian. In the subordinations, yeah. yeah. He, he, he mentioned all three of them, Holy, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as divine beings. Mm. Persons, but not as a one in essence or substance yeah. or nature. Yeah. You get that there's some restrictions between them. Yeah. What's interesting about Origin as well, he says that some of his followers uh, believe the Paraclete or the Comforter that yeah. Jesus prophesied to come was Paul. Like some of his disciples. Yeah, but but, yeah. Isn't Comforter referred to as being the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit? Yeah, in the New Testament in John. Yeah. Uh, but it seems that some early Christians understood it to refer. For origin, to be honest, I, I don't think I should hold Origin to too big of a standard, too high of a standard, because he is a bit crazy in his ideas. He yeah. believes that humans are like fallen angels. Or the oh, idea that we can, he's kind of a universalist, kind of. So he's a bit wacky, but he is I hope most of the church fathers, if not all of them, had views which we would today consider to be heretical or unorthodox anyway. Yeah, it's, just, it's just quite very yeah. mm. Which is why it took so long to figure out which was the kind of the great view of the Trinity. In the New Testament, you have uh, like proto Trinity, like early forms of the doctrine developing. Yeah. Um, so, especially if you look at the Gospel of Mark and you compare it with Matthew and Luke, uh, you see Matthew and Luke make changes to Mark in order to bring out later Christian teachings yeah. such as the Trinity and so on. I'd say all, all four Gospels imply some divinity. I mean, I don't have the Bible on me, so I can't, I can't find it. But yeah, yeah. In the beginning of, I think it's the beginning of Matthew or Mark, I, don't, I forgot which one, but I think that there is a mention of divinity within the very first few kind of passages of the, the text, although I can't, I don't know. Do you mean John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word? Yeah, that's an example, but that... You, you won't figure of that out, okay. I think if I had a Bible, it would be much easier, but I know at the very beginning so, of Matthew, there is... So people the usually, they refer to Mark 1, yeah. where Mark says, as it's written um, in Isaiah, um, that prepared the way of the Lord. Do you mean that one? Uh, I wish I had a Bible on me. Okay. I can try to find it here. Well, Mark, even though it's the earliest of the four Gospels to be written, oh, I've actually got a Bible on my phone, so... Do yeah, you mean Matthew chapter 1? Yeah, it might be Matthew or... I think I'm not. I, I forgot what I'm referring to. But somebody showed me something. It might be this, for example, where he's called Emmanuel, God is with us. Oh, okay. So maybe I'm not, I don't know if that's what I was I was referring to. But perhaps. That yeah, is. yeah. So, so you know this verse. It says yeah. he shall be called called Emmanuel, not yeah. that he will be Emmanuel, but he shall be called Emmanuel. So there's a difference between, and you know, it's common in Jewish, um, like in Jewish culture, to name their children. Um, after a name of God, like has some kind of attribute of God. So like, you know, the name Israel, the Rest L at the end has some, um, there's also, um, <laughs> uh, there, there, there's also um, others like Elijah. I think Elijah means God himself or Yahweh himself. Yeah, yeah, I think Yahweh Elijah, is God. Yahweh yeah, is God yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, if you I'm look at the... Are there people before Jesus called Emmanuel? Like, are, are there, there is, are there, in, in yeah. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 8. Okay. Isaiah 8, 8. Yeah. The people say we have Emmanuel amongst us. Okay. Uh, but if you yeah, look... It could be prophetic. Yeah. Um, well, it's, hey, I'm it's I'm fixed I'm in the yeah. present tense. I mean, okay, it's possible. Yeah. But um, 
No, but it's like lots of Bible prophecy, like wisdom too, for example, speaks in the present tense. Yeah, yeah. It's referring to, I don't know, the Messiah. But you know, or, wisdom yeah. is actually feminine. Oh, uh, Sophia. Yeah, Sophia yes. yeah, yeah. It's actually female. Yes. Take it literally. Uh, because it's just a uh, a way of like a, one of God's attributes personified, um, and just a way of speaking about God, nearness uh, without being literal. Uh, so Christians kind of adopted Sophia language, and they applied that later on to Jesus. Like with the wisdom too. I mean, like this is this is old, this is like apocrypha, right? This is like this is between the New Testament and Old Testament. Well, there's proverbs. Proverbs have wisdom language. No, and it the, depends on which church you the belong to. There's a book of wisdom. The, oh, there's, there's a book called Wisdom within the Apocrypha, which I think yeah. the Orthodox it, it, and the Catholic it, 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 Church. Yeah, it's in the Catholic yeah. Bible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Orthodox. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, the Bible I have has it, but yeah, yeah. I don't have it with me because I just go. What are you? Are you which church you belong to? Uh, I haven't determined. Oh, okay. Uh, so you don't know whether you're Protestant or Catholic I, I or Orthodox? Know, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to start from the ground up, you know, so what I've been doing oh, okay. is reading very early church documents so this book new eusebius i got second hand and it includes lots of early church documents so clement origin eusebius even ignatius of antioch even like the pictures of christians from romans or pagans about christians is within this book you know in the fourth the fourth century right so i'm using that as a basis of what you seem the to, earliest christians believed you know? uh, why don't you just read the bible <laughs> No, because I don't think it's, I think I might misinterpret things, you know. The problem with yeah. Orthodox Christians is like with respect, is they spend more time reading other writings than reading the Bible itself. No, but what I'm saying is, but the Bible itself is not, is not sufficient to determine doctrine. Because they use the Bible, the Unitarians use the Bible, and they, they still get the conclusion of Unitarianism. Yeah. The Unitarians use the Bible and they still get the conclusion of Unitarianism. So the easiest way to settle this issue is to look at the earliest Christians and say, what did they think? If they weren't Unitarians, then that settles it. But that, that also doesn't settle the issue as well, because as you see, the Church Fathers had different beliefs amongst yeah, exactly. themselves and to what Christians did they believe. So. The bad part, I'm not sure if I can trust this, but it's on Wikipedia, so maybe not the best, but he says that the Antinocene Fathers were subordinations. Well, like, I think he says nearly all of them. So maybe that leans it closer towards subordinationism being the, not Unitarian, because they commit these separate things, but subordinationism being maybe the most apostolic doctrine, I don't know. Unitarians are subordinate, like they believe Jesus is subject to God. Yes, but more as a servant. Say, you know? Yeah. Which isn't the subordinationist idea. Oh, okay. Subordinationism is like, he's a God, but quote unquote, according to origin, a second God. Oh, I see. And somehow less powerful than the Father. But I, the issue is, I, I don't know how to justify it. It's like you can. Subordinationism is implied, but subordinationism of what? That's the question, and I still can't figure that out. And I still can't justify it, you know, why they should be subordinated. There were some Jews in the first century who regarded Moses as a second god. They referred to him as De Deuterophios. So it seems that Christians, they adopted that type of language and then you applied that to Jesus no, instead. Even, I mean, this is so thing, but if you do look at kind of the Jews pre-Christ, there does they they tend to be some multiplicity, multiplicity within God. So you have the Kabbalah, for example, which I don't know very much about, to be honest, but it, it's not too far off having like 10 persons, you know. It implies multiplicity within the Godhead. And then you have Philo, right? Yeah. He's like a semi-Aryan. And then you have the Old Testament, which has the angel of the Lord. So we do see multiplicity within Judaism and the Old Testament. So, but the angel of the Lord yeah. in the Old Testament is kind of like an enigma. Um, so it doesn't refer to any one single person. But it can be a, a messenger sent by God. No, the Not issue is necessarily. The angel of the Lord and Lord are terms used interchangeably. Like, yeah. I think. I, I don't have the Bible with me, so I can't tell you, but Exodus 2. One of the first few verses in Exodus 2, I think, refers to the angel of the Lord. And it refers to the angel of the Lord interchangeably with the term Lord. So the Lord and the angel of the Lord are somehow the same, but interchangeable terms. But well, you know, there is no definite article for the angel of the Lord uh, yeah, in the yeah. Hebrew. It's just an angel of yeah. the Lord. Okay, so the angel represents God. It's a messenger of God, but it's not God. 
um, it's like when God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and sent him to speak to Ahaz. Um, and then it goes on to say that the Lord said to King Ahaz, even though it's not uh, God speaking physically, but it's Isaiah communicating God's words. So, yeah, I'm trying to figure out, like, yeah, I'm trying to figure out why these two terms are used interchangeably. You know how speaking through. So, so Jesus um, in the New Testament uh, isn't an angel, but the angels come to minister and serve Christ. Angel um, implies a me angel isn't necessarily like a cherubim or, or like a seraphim. It's not like a winged being with like eight mm. eyes. It, it's more like a messenger, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Not, okay, a messenger which can imply an angel like a cherubim or mm. an actual physical messenger who goes and runs and sends messages. So you know like there's a prophet in the Old Testament, yeah. um, his name is um, Haigar, is that how you say it? Haigar. I'm not very familiar with it, yeah. So um, he's actually referred to as an angel okay. in the Hebrew, yeah. but it's trans so then Haigar, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, but in the Hebrew it actually says um, angel, yeah. angel of the Lord. So the word angel can also be translated as messenger. So it doesn't always have to refer to some oh, spiritual or celestial being. Yeah. But did you think you could worship the angel of the Lord? Did, uh, you, did you think you should worship the angel of the Lord? Do you think that's... Yeah, so, so you know like um, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, it is written you should only worship, yeah. worship God and serve Him only. Yeah. So worship only belongs to God. Uh, you've only had the verses with me, but I, I do. I'm very, very sure that there is a verse that implies that they worship, that says that they worship the the, of the Lord. I can try to find it. Be Lord. Well, I don't have battery either, so I'm basically. But in, waste you know, your your view, your view, uh, Jesus is the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. Because yeah, oh, okay. yes. you know, the angel of the Lord is present at Jesus' birth. Um. An angel, though. I mean, yeah, it's tough, though. I need to learn Hebrew. But in the, in the Hebrew, yeah. it says the same that's thing as issue, well. Though, because one thing I'm doing right now is I'm trying to learn ancient Greek, you know, so I can properly interpret the text. Again, we have the issue of not speaking Hebrew, so getting things mixed up. But why do you think the angel of the Lord is referred to with the V, with the definite article, whilst here it's just an indefinite article? Do you think that's. <laughs> Say that again? You see here where it says angel, an angel of the Lord. Yeah. And then. You know, actually, yeah. in the King James Bible, as you said, the angel of the Lord okay. uh, in Matthew chapter one. Yeah, um, but yeah, I'm just to figure out why yeah. they differently. Okay. It could yeah. be some kind of manuscript variant, yeah, okay. or it could yeah. just be translation. Um, I, I need to. I need to. Um, but I do know in the Hebrew there's no definite article for okay, yeah. angel of the Lord. Um, and also, you know, in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, um, that seems to refute the idea that Jesus is an angel, because it says um, Christ was. Uh, made lower than the like he was above the angels yeah. and then he was made lower so that seems to apply with someone other than the angels no 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 but I'm not saying angels in general I mean like divine being who is a messenger of God so like a representative of God mm. so angel like if you read like Numbers 20, 14 right doesn't necessarily refer to a cherubim as I said it can refer to like a say a human being who's a messenger but angel of the Lord who is some sort of divine being isn't necessarily a cherubim but could just be a divine being which is a messenger of God you know the thing about the Bible is often you have um, the, um, I forgot what it's referred to now um, but basically um, like in Exodus chapter 7 um, God instructs Moses or he says the staff that is in my hand um, I will strike it with the river now um, and then he orders Moses to strike the river now with the staff um, and he does that and then it says the Lord struck the river now. So this is divine agency type language. Um, even Jesus uses this type of language. Um, when Jesus says um, in John chapter 7, um, when uh, Moses gave you circumcision, even though um, long before Moses it was actually God who gave circumcision to Abraham. So it doesn't mean Jesus believed Moses is God. But it's, um, it's um, I just said it, but I forgot the word, but um, it's a figurative language basically that's being used. What's well, so in the sense that they say God does something when it was humans who did it? Yeah, it's still God, like God's in control, okay, okay. 
but the humans are representative of God. So it's like um, in Exodus it says, Moses and Aaron visited the people, but it ends by saying that it was God who visited them. So Moses and Aaron, they like represent God. Or like in Deuteronomy. So, so Moses and Aaron visit these people. Yeah. And then it says God visited these people. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I, I'll show you. Um, in Exodus chapter 4. So towards the end. So then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words that Lord, the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, he had seen their affliction and they bowed their heads and worshipped. And they worshipped well, well, God. God. It implies yeah. God. Uh, yeah. But here it says, um, when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, yeah. So it, it wasn't literally or physically the Lord, but it was Moses and Aaron who gathered the people and spoke to them. But would you think that worship is something exclusive to God? Yes. So when the angel of the Lord is worshipped, does that not imply that it is God? I, can, can I have search, to okay. see, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want me to try for it? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, apparently this is one. When the Lord of the Palestine and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way of his son's son, and he bowed his head and fell back to his face. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think that's the verse I was looking for. But oh, I see, see okay. Because you also have Bathsheba, the queen, she does that to David. Uh, she puts her face on the ground and I think she calls him Lord. Um, yes. Yes, it, it's oh, okay, this is another one. By Joshua. Okay, there's, there's we're, just, we're just discussing the of the Lord and Did why it's worship? worship, yeah. In what sense? How we worship God? No, if, if, so, if worship is exclusive to God, then if the angel of the Lord is worshipped, can I just see the verse of the Lord? Yeah, okay. For, uh, yeah. Joshua so Phil. Maybe that divinity, you know, or goodness. Yeah, maybe, maybe. yeah I, the thing is, I would say this isn't that clear because it says he did worship, but it doesn't necessarily say he did worship to the angel. It just says that he fell on the ground and did worship and then he spoke to the angel. Um, so it's not necessarily, uh, but I'll show you something similar um, where the same thing is done with King David um, in 1 Kings chapter 1. Uh, but Sheba bowed and paid homage to the king and the king said what do you desire and she said my lord you swore to your servant my lord your god saying Solomon your son shall reign after me and he shall sit on my throne so here but Sheba um, she bows and paid homage to David and she calls him my lord but I think it's a distinctive worship and like bowing and showing I, be respect, I believe you know. it's the same Hebrew word yeah. That's used in Joshua chapter 5. No, because isn't it oh. with, what's his name, Jacob? You know Jacob and the multicolored, uh, what's it, coats? Yeah, exactly, you know, when yeah. When he comes back, they, they, I think they prostrate to him, but that doesn't imply worship, it's just have respect. Homage, yeah. yeah. So, that's, so, that's the question. Is it, so, so you know yeah. when the New Testament uses the word worship, mm. it's actually latrio, and latrio explicitly is only used for God the Father. It's never in use for Jesus or anyone else in a positive sense. Yeah. Uh, whereas the word um, that's used for Christ in the New Testament is Pasakanayo. And Pasakanayo is used for God as well as Jesus. Uh, so it can be used for both. Um, and the same word is also used in the Old Testament in the Greek translation. Uh, like for Joseph, for example, or for David. Um, and also, I think, believe for Joshua as well, because I just wanted to look up the, the Hebrew word. So,
Yeah, so this word, uh, Saha, so that's the uh, equivalent to the Greek word Pasakanaya in the New Testament. So you say there's different words for worship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the New Testament, there's two words for worship. One is Lacherio, and the other word is Pasakanaya. So Lacherio is only used for the Father in a positive sense. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Pasakanaya, that's used for, it's a general word. You know, I've got, I've got ancient Greek textbooks in here because I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, learn ancient Greek or kind of New Testament Greek because they're quite similar just so I can probably interpret the, the Bible. Let me. Yeah, I feel like most of it is clouded by the, the translations. Anyway, it's good that you're thinking for yourself yeah, and you're I'm, not I'm just... Trying stand, uh, I'm trying to start ground up, you know, oh. with the church fathers specifically, with the, with the early Christian texts. So these are the two yeah. different words for worship. Uh, Latrio. La, la, how you say la it? Trevo, la trevo. La trevo. The, the U becomes okay. a, a V when it's when it has a vowel after. So this is religious cultic worship, whereas this word prasakanayo, this is more common. Proskineo. 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 Because U becomes an I, it, it's, it's strange. Depending on where the U is, it's pronounced different ways. So yeah, this word yeah. is news for like King David or okay, yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted to look up that uh, verse in Joshua chapter 5. See the, see the Greek? Yeah, or the, or the Hebrew. Um, I mean, of course. I mean, it is, it is our testament. So if it's the same word, then it will be Pasakanayo in Greek. Yeah, it's Saha, yeah. Sahar, yeah. Is that it's is that, that same word that was used for David. Okay, fine. Yeah. So it's a different form of word. So, so it's Prasaka. Yeah. I'll show you. Um, there's this book by um, James Dunn. Have you heard of him? Um, he's a biblical scholar. Okay. Uh, he wrote a book called Did the First Christians um, Worship Jesus? I'm just wondering, when you see the grouping in the New Testament? Yeah, okay, this yeah, one, yeah. yeah. When you see the grouping of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what do you think it refers to? Which verse do you have in mind? So, like Matthew 28 19, and also like Clement of Rome, like all of these church fathers I'm referring to, which I don't know, depending on who you ask, the Trinitarians or subordinationists, all of them group up these three terms Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What, what do you think this is the case? And what do you think it refers to? Um, so there's no verse in the whole Bible in which the word God is used to apply to all three at the same time. Yeah, I guess like, there are so, three letters by yeah. baptizing the name of the Father, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Yeah, but it doesn't say yeah. that the three are one being yeah, or right. one nature. Um, I mean, it depends because it, it, it says that Jesus is of, of, of what does it say, like essence, same essence, mirror essence, something about like a mirror image, which doesn't put the same essence. Yeah, so I could say in, in, in my name and in your name and also in Isa's name, who just the guy who just left. Doesn't mean that we're we're like you know three persons in one being or one nature. Um, so you can mention. Yeah, I'm sorry, like, what do you think they grouped up as part of something really spiritual? Uh, it's an interesting verse. Um, I mean, the Unitarians, the way they explain it, is to say. Um, that you're baptized into the Father through Jesus by the aid of the Holy Spirit or something to that effect. Um, but you know, um, if you look at the creedal formulas on the, in the New Testament, none of them mention the Holy Spirit. Yeah, let me, it's, like, it's like 1 Corinthians 15, I think. Is yeah. Let me see. I had the Bible on here. <laughs> yeah, so the Holy Spirit um, is it mentioned um, in any of the creeds? So like Paul for example says unto us there's one God the Father and one Lord Jesus Christ because, but there's no yeah, mention of the Holy the Spirit. The will think that the, the Father and the Holy Spirit are basically the same. Yeah, yeah. So th their view is that the New Testament writers are non-Trinitarians so it would agree with... Maybe this one. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Basically, say this is what I've received. This kind of creed. It says, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in faith. Yes, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for us in the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Yeah, it talks about the witnesses of his resurrection. Yeah, the witnesses. It, the it's yeah. not only that the Holy Spirit is left out of Peter's yeah. statement, for example, 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 8, verse 6, yeah, but the other thing is the Holy Spirit doesn't have a name, unlike the title Father and Son. So the Father's name is Yahweh, yeah. and the Son's name is Jesus. But if the Holy Spirit is the person, then what is the name of the Holy Spirit? And also, um, there's never greetings from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So like in Romans... Yeah. Honestly, does, does the Holy Spirit ever communicate to the Father? No. That's interesting because that's maybe that's where subordination is, is rooted. Maybe. When what, sorry? Because maybe that's where subordination is, is rooted. It's the idea that the Holy Spirit is kind of a, a mimic of the, the Father in a way. But do they believe the Holy Spirit is the person? Because they're non Trinitarian, so. Yeah. I need to look more to Origin because it's very hard to read at times because he says some strange stuff which they don't really understand. So you know Paul, for example, in Romans yeah. chapter 1 verse 7, uh, let me just look it up. Uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's no greetings or grace you know, from the Holy Spirit. And, and you say that God refers to a divine being. Yeah. yeah. yeah so so when, when Thomas calls Jesus my Lord and my God, what do you think he means? So there he could be calling Jesus God in the same way that Moses is called God in the Old Testament yeah. or in the same way Solomon is called God in the Old Testament. Um, and even angels are called God and judges are called God. So it could be called, yeah. And also... Yeah. I think it's also the Greek word. Yeah, it so is, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the same word that Jesus uses. You know when the Jews pick up some stone in, um, and he says, for which of these works do you stone me? And they say, we stone you not for any of these works, but we stone you because you are a man claiming to be God or equal to God. Yes. And then Jesus answers and says to them, is it not written in your law? Um, then he quotes, I have said you are God. And there it's the same Greek word, Theos, and that's where, that Thomas yeah. uses for Jesus. And that's where the orthodox idea of Theosis comes from. Because they believe that when we die, we will become, in a sense, God, because we will be like, kind of oh, purified really? in a way. I think they get that from 2 Peter. Yeah. I think part of from this, because <laughs> I saw an orthodox tunnel and they read Oh, this really? Part. Okay. When it says, so that's like, a bit like Mormonism. Yeah. Do you know what the Mormons believe? That as God yeah. was. Uh, yeah. Sorry, as man is, God was. So I think God but, in the sense anyway. of it, kind of... That means that you'll eventually become perfection. God if you lead a perfect life. No, I think it's when you die and you're cleansed of your sins, you're perfect and in a way. Mm. You, you're so united to God that you in your own way become But then so how many gods will there be? Yeah, <laughs> anyway. yeah. I think I need to look into it because I don't really understand it to be honest. But yeah. I feel like the more and more like as time goes by, um, Christianity becomes less like how Jews, for example, would believe in religion. Uh, so Jews were basically monotheists. Um, I mean, but there is, there is some more history. You know, you have yeah. Philo, who was like a semi-Aryan. But you know, these were Greek-speaking Jews. Yeah, but in terms of the Aramaic or the Palestinian Jews... Was um, it the Bala also from the Greek-speaking Jews? I don't know, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's I'm Hebrew, tempted to say I'm tempted to say yes, but yeah, because uh, if it's Greek speaking Jews, it's probably more obvious. Like the Septuagint, for example, that's in Greek, right? Mm. If the Kabbalah is depicted in Hebrew, then I'd assume it's maybe from Hebrew speaking. But yeah, I, yeah. If you look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, mm. uh, she was a Palestinian Jew, but she never worshipped her son, but she never prayed to her son, and James, the brother of Jesus, as well. He was a pious, law-abiding, righteous Jew. Um, when you say Palestinian, what, like, 
So Palestinian are uh, those Jews that spoke uh, Aramaic. No, but isn't Palestinian isn't the term comes from the term Philistine, right? Yeah. So maybe it's like. So I mean, in New Testament times, so what was referred to as Palestine is what. Wait, does it use the term Palestine in the New Testament? In Greek? I'm not too sure. So I know the Roman know. prophets at the time was called Judea, I think. So you know, in the Book of Acts, in Acts chapter six, yeah. um, it speaks yeah. about the seven Hellenists. So those were people like Stephen. So okay. these were like Greek Jews uh, yeah, that were Greek in language and culture. Like cool as well. like was yeah. yeah. Whereas the disciples of Jesus, uh, they were Hebrew-speaking yes. Jews. Yeah. Even when Jesus appears to Paul, it says yeah. Jesus spoke to him in Hebrew. But Apparently there's some semantic stuff in the New Testament which is which only works in Greek, but I forgot it. Yeah. It's only had the phone. Uh, I think I know. Uh, the, you, I think I know one example that you're referring to about um, Nicodemus. When Jesus says to him, "You must be born again," and but then Nicodemus misunderstood it before he meant it uh, to be born again a second time, whereas Jesus meant to be born from above. But that can only work if the conversation that they had was in Greek rather than in yeah, um, Aramaic. It might have been that, but it could have been something else. So I'm not sure. um, but yeah, uh, have you looked into any other religions? I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with Islam because... No, uh, coming so, here, yeah. I mean, I think I have a very basic knowledge of other world religions just through things like religion mm. education at school. Oh, uh, okay, so that's, cool. That's kind of it, you know. Did you do RE as an option? No, no, no. I should have, but I didn't. Yeah, me too, yeah. yeah. Not even as GCSE. What do you understand about Islam or what do you know about Islam? I understand that we're strict monotheists. Yeah. I understand that if Jesus was a human, you believe that uh, you believe in the Quran and then the Hadith. And the Hadith explains things. I guess in terms of the monotheism, what do you think of that? Do you think it's true? The do you think monotheism? Do I think monotheism is it's true? true? Yeah. I think I think it can be logical in some of the things it can be logical. Mm. But I mean, I, I'm a monotheist. I mean, even Christians are monotheists in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you say in a way they are monotheists rather than they are monotheists? Everybody's a monotheist yeah. in their own way, you know, like oh, subordinationists okay. are monotheists, but they have their own ideas. Muslims are monotheists, they have their own ideas. Shia, I'm not sure, I'm not sure about Shia, but they, from what I know, from the yeah, slander I've heard, they have their own strange ideas. No, they're, they're so everybody's a monotheist, but they, within that, they, they think of God in different ways. That's what I'd say. Um, who do you regard the Prophet Muhammad to be? Do you believe he was sent by God or...? I don't know. What, I don't, I'm not sure why I believe he was sent by God. Okay. Like, for example, with Jesus, you have lots of prophecy, lots of it in the Old Testament. Some of it I mentioned, like Wisdom 2, Isaiah 9, 6, which I was going to come on to. But yeah, something to Isaiah 3. Lots of things which refer to the Messiah. So the Jews believe in a Messiah, don't they? And they believe he'll be a prince of peace in the same way we believe Jesus was a Messiah and Say, a peaceful man. Hey, you right? Oh, hey. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's very rational to believe in Christ as a, as a messenger of God because he because he was prophesied. You know, the belief that Christ is kind of in in, in, in uh, how to put this in cooperation with the New Testament is a reason to believe in him and his his divinity. You know. Mm. You know, Isaiah chapter nine verse six. It's yes. not actually found in the Septuagint. So you know in the Greek translation of the Bible, yeah. um, you don't find um, unto us such, so you don't find um, uh, he shall be called everlasting father, mighty God, wonderful champion. Yeah. Yeah. So you'll find um, unto us a child is born and he shall be a messenger from the council or something like this. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. So I assume it's, 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 it's kind of... It's read differently, oh, yeah. Okay, it says yeah. messenger instead of like mighty God, Prince of Peace, okay. or everlasting Father. Yeah, yeah. The Muslims don't, like obviously Muslims believe in Jesus, so we don't necessarily deny that Jesus 
was prophesied uh, by prophets yeah. before him, um, but not necessarily. Uh, he could have been. So we're open to the idea that he could have been prophesied. But uh, Muslim, we do believe that the Prophet Muhammad was prophesied, and there may be some remnants of those prophecies in the Bible today. I feel like it's, 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 the arguments I've heard seem to be much, much weaker. Like one reference I see is John, like I think 14 about the the Comforter who is to come. Yeah. Yet, you know, it, for us to come to it as being the Holy Ghost, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I don't think it's strong enough to, I don't think it's anywhere near strong enough to use that as reasoning to believe. So, in the early church, not all Christians believed that the Comforter referred to there was the Holy Spirit. So, Tertullian, for example, he at one time was a follower of Montanus. And Montanus was declared as a heretic by orthodoxy oh, okay. because he claimed to yeah. be the paraclete yeah, or the comforter. The, 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 the term rings a bell, but I, it's in the book I have, but I didn't read the text. Yeah, yeah. So, kind of, I, kind so of Ma Matanus yeah. was an early Christian leader and he claimed to be the paraclete prophesied okay, okay. by Jesus and Tertullian at one time followed uh, Matanus. Um, and also, I mentioned Origen before. No, oh, hey, ah, how yeah. are you? Okay. Assalamualaikum. Assalam. Okay. Oh, uh, so you. Cool. Oh, uh, so Origen mentioned that some of his disciples, he Paul was the Paraclete. Um, there's Raymond Brown's uh, two-volume commentary to John's Gospel. Uh, he makes mention that there's some biblical scholars they believe that the Paraclete um, uh, originally referred to some male salvific figure. Yeah. that was later confused with the uh, Holy Spirit by later Christian traditions. Yeah. I mean, I and also because... Verse, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> oh, are you looking for the verse that refers to the paraclete as the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yes, yeah, in jo John 14 verse 26. John 14 26. Uh, 26, you say, yes. Yeah. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom my Father will send in my yeah, name. Yeah. So I teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So you know when it says, which is the Holy Ghost, mm. that's a parenthesis made by the author John. So Jesus says, but the Comforter, uh, and then it says, which is the Holy Spirit. So that's like an edi editorial comment made by the author himself. But the author wants you to is trying to draw the uh, readers to his own conclusion who the paraclete is. But Jesus didn't originally say, but the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. But it's something that, it's, it's like a commentary. Uh, you know the one thing about John's Gospel that makes it different from the other Gospels is that sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between the words of the author and the words of Jesus, okay. like John 3.16. Is that John speaking or is that Jesus speaking? I forgot to love the word. Yeah, so some, some yeah. say it's John and some say it's Jesus yeah. speaking. Uh, yeah. No, because I'm just thinking... It's the idea that when Jesus, when he was resurrected, no, when he ascended, right, as, as soon as that happens, the Holy Spirit descended onto the people like in Pentecost. It's the idea that the Holy Spirit guided the Christians after Christ's ascension. Let me, let, me find, let me find another, I think John 16 as well. Reference. The thing about the day of Pentecost, that was another, that's a different prophecy that has been fulfilled. It's from the book of Joel, chapter 2. Let, let me two, find yeah. another, John 14, I think. And I will pray that Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, and the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwells within you. So it's trying to come to it as the spirit of truth, mm. you cannot see, yet he talks within you, which seems to line quite closely with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so generally there's two chapters about the Comforter. Yeah, it's like John 14, yeah. John 16, 17. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a passage in, uh, in chapter 15 as well, uh, but generally uh, chapter 16, when it speaks about the Comforter, it's not speaking about the Holy Spirit, but it's speaking about another Comforter to come after Jesus who Jesus also refers to the spirit of truth. Uh, but in chapter 14, uh, it, generally when it speaks about the comforter, it refers to the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's why in chapter 14 it says, uh, the world has not seen him, 
but you know him because he, he is with you and he's in you. Yes. It yes. depends on which translation you read, um, because there's some manuscript or there's a manuscript that says that he's with you and he's in you, yes. but there's some manuscripts that say he, he's with you and he shall be in you. Uh, but so chapter 14, you can say generally, it's about the Holy Spirit, yeah, but chapter 16 is about a prophet to come after it. And the reason why I say that is because Jesus says in verse 7 of chapter 16 um, that he must go away uh, for the Comforter to come. Yes. Or if he goes not away, the Comforter will not come. Yes. Whereas the Holy Spirit was already with the disciples and was in them. As you know, when, he, when the Spirit of Truth has come, he'll guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak himself, but whatever, whatsoever he shall hear. That's how he speak, and he yeah. shall do you with things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, and therefore I said that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Yeah. So that seems to be speaking about a prophet, yeah. that he should not speak of himself, but only speak what he is. Whereas, how can God be told what to say? Or how can God only hear what he's being told? Uh, it's the idea, this is kind of, even with the Orthodox, you have monarchical Trinitarianism, which is the idea that the Father is the fountain of the Godhead. So the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son is begotten of the Father eternally. So even in that sense, like, like Christ's will comes from the Father because he proceeds from the Father, that's the idea. Mm. In the same way, all that the Holy Spirit has comes Jesus, you'd say begotten actually, so everything that the Holy Spirit has proceeds from the Father. Which is why, for example, Jesus say, submits the Father in his will, because his will is that of the Father. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, but what does that actually mean? So like, when you say that um, he shall not speak of himself, and you only speak what he hears, um, that more sounds like a prophet, or someone who's inspired, rather than it sounds like God coming. Okay. Um, and he will you know, prophesize or declare the things that are to come yeah. and he will guide you to all truth. So what some scholars say is um, that Jesus will, uh, sorry, the, 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 the spirit of truth will supplement uh, Jesus' teachings, like he will continue his teachings, but he will also bring a new revelation as well. So in John 14 it's quite clear it's the Holy Spirit. So yeah. So you're kind of presupposing that this is a different comforter and that mm. the, the spirit of truth, when it says the spirit of truth, it's not in the original text, that's what you're implying, or it's ad added by the author. Yeah, I mean, that's one way of looking I mean, at it, yeah. That's, that's the thing, I mean, like... I mean, there's different layers to yeah. the argument. I mean, another layer of the argument, because I want to try to make it as simple as possible and not okay, overcomplicate yeah. it. Uh, but it, it, basically, John's Gospel, has gone through several stages of editing. So there's different layers. So, you know, there, there's um, Jesus' um, final discourse to the disciples is actually represented in two different versions. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think uh, so yeah. if you go to chapter 14, uh, there in that cha chapter, uh, Jesus, um, you know, inst gives instructions to the disciples yeah. and says to them that I have more things to say to you, but come, rise let us depart from here uh, but then he continues for another yeah. three more chapters so yeah. Yeah. it does seem that the, the, yeah. those cha three chapters were sandwiched or inserted in between yeah. chapter 14 and 18. No, yeah. well, what I mean is that like for you to make the connection between this and a prophet who is Muhammad requires lots of presupposition such as such the idea that of, that the John's come through. In search and, and that these two different verses go to something different. You know, that's the idea. I don't, I don't think it's, 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 it's very strong it, it, to it, it, It's based on reason. Okay, That's to yeah. do with how you read John's Gospel. So, so often John speaks in one single voice. Uh, so sometimes Jesus speaks, but it's not clear when Jesus ends and where John begins. Um, and also the way Jesus speaks in John. It's different from the other Gospels. So Jesus has long sermons, whereas in the other Gospels, Jesus speaks in parables and he gives short speeches. Um, and also in John, uh, the content of Jesus' teaching is about himself. 
that I am this and I am that. Whereas in the other gospel, the content is about God, or it's about the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, so in John, whether Jesus is speaking to his disciples or whether he's speaking to the Jews, um, it, the message seems to be consistent throughout, but it's also very consistently different from the other Gospels as well. Uh, so, so John is highly interpretive account yeah. I mean, as well. I know this is its own rabbit hole, but for me, I don't really have an issue with the corruption of the Bible because as I say, as in, in a sense, I don't, I don't believe it's, it's, I don't believe it's really happened. I believe maybe there's copyist errors and maybe some insertions. But I, I think these, these changes are, you know, how Bo Oman says, it's insignificant to Christian doctrine. Because if you read, kind of, I mentioned Church Fathers I was reading. I mean, not Church Fathers because some are considered heretics, but often what they do is they will reference parts of the, 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 uh, the New Testament, right? They will reference parts of the Gospels. Mm. And what I find is that I don't see anything that they quote or reference that isn't in what we have today. Like the patristic quotations that I see in these texts mm -hmm. align completely with the text we have today. So I, I don't think that, I, I don't think it's, as Bart Ehrman believes, this atheist scholar, I don't think any of these differences are significant enough to imply some huge change in Christian doctrine. Yeah, yeah, this is more to do with the composition of the New Testament okay, yeah. and how and when the Gospels were written. Yeah. Uh, so John's Gospel, um, originally, my understanding, spoke about the paraclete, but it spoke about another future paraclete, who will oh, be I'll like Jesus. Monsters, because that's, that, yeah. I have... I have, as I mentioned, I have a book which includes a chapter of texts which are Montanist. I see. But I haven't read through them because it's one of many, many pages. And also, if you look at the Gospel of Mark, uh, in Mark, sometimes when Jesus speaks about the Son of Man, yeah. it seems to speak, be speaking about the future, like, prophetic figure to come, or, or a judge that would come in the future. Like Jesus says in Mark, um, whoever rejects me from this generation, so show the Son of Man when he comes. So it implies the Son of Man hasn't yet come. But when he comes, he shall also reject you as well. Who do you think the Son of Man is? So my understanding is it refers to a prophet to come after. The no, prophet Muhammad. If you, if you know Daniel 7, 14, I think so, I find it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a very famous verse. The, the vision that Daniel has, yes, yeah. I saw of the four beasts. And then one like a son of man. Yeah, I saw one like a son of man yeah. coming with the clouds of heaven. It approaches the ancients like of yes. day. Yeah. Yes. But you know, Daniel chapter 7 is actually one of the unique places in the entire Bible in which it actually tells you the commentary yeah. to that vision because Daniel didn't understand the dream, the interpretation. So uh, he's, an angel is nearby and the angel explains to him what he saw. So in that vision, he's told um, that the four empires or the four beasts, they represent uh, different empires or nations that go against God. And the Son of Man are, is it refers to the saints of the Most High. No, but what I say is, what I say is so the, the most, Son of Man. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just read it? And it says, Sorry, yeah. and there was given dominion, there was given him dominion and glory right, and the kingdom yeah. that all peoples, nations and languages to serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that w that which shall not be destroyed. Yeah. So if you carry on reading, yeah. uh, like like in verse and 22 yeah. and 27, okay. uh, it says the same yeah. thing about the saints of the Most yeah. High. Until the end of the days came, and the judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. Yeah. The time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. But so they possessed the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking when I see so Daniel 7:14. The, yeah. yeah. They're the one like the Son of Man as the saints yeah. of the Most High. That's who it refers to in its original context. But I think... Which get, app yeah. are you using, by the way? That's actually quite a good app. Yeah, you should get it. It's, yeah, what's it's the, KGV, what's, I think. Okay. I don't like the KGV, but it's what I have. It's quite, it's quite convenient. Yeah, it's really convenient because oftentimes I don't have battery. I thought I had something like that, yeah. but anyway, yeah. I also yeah. have a Book of Mormon on here. Oh, really? I don't know okay. why I have it, but okay, I it was cool. cool to have. Uh, yeah, so Daniel 7, that passage refers to... Um, it's all you can think of it because... I, and you know the title yeah. Son of Man, you know the Church Fathers, they understood that to refer to Jesus' humanity and the title Son of God to refer yeah. to his divine nature. Yeah. No, what, what I'd say is that... I think Daniel 7 is 14 and I think you mentioned yeah. Daniel 7 22 or 27. Yeah, yeah. I think 
there are similarities in these verses, but there is also a difference. Because when it comes to the Son of Man in Daniel 7.14, down to, yeah, to Daniel 7.14, it talks much more extensively about what he has and the authority given to him. It says that these, I think these saints will possess the kingdom, they'll be kind of inhabitants of the kingdom. But it's a Son of Man that all nations, peoples and languages will serve, will, will be served by. Uh, uh, but the, yeah, the yeah. same thing he said about the saints as well, it, yeah. that all nations will come and serve. Mm -hmm. Oh, verse 27. Okay. Yeah. So it says, um, Saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is everlasting and dominion, um, and shall serve and obey. It says him, but in the original um, Hebrew or Aramaic, uh, I don't think that pronoun is there, him. Um, so when you think, when it says his dominion is an everlasting dominion, is that referring to the Father, you think, or to the Son of Man? Well, it's referring to the future, like this kingdom will be everlasting. So it could be like hyperbole, yeah. could be, it could just mean like for a very long time. Yeah, so for like, example, yeah. I could say this bus is taking forever. So it doesn't literally mean it's taking forever, it just means like yeah. really long. <laughs> or it's taking forever to download this movie yeah. or something like that. But I see, you know, you know the verses in Matthew 16 and 18, yeah. it refers to Peter and then the... In the same way as the ideas of the, the apostles given, the ability to loose and bind, I think there are similarities within these verses, but at the same time, the Son of Man has a different authority to that of the other saints. That's the word I see. And here, I mean, you might say it's hyperbole, but dominion is given to the Son of Man and people serve Him rather than just inhabiting or possessing the kingdom of being within it. Oh, be careful. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, the word Him, I don't think okay. it's there in the Hebrew. Uh, yeah, um, to, and some Hebrew. translations, like I think the RSV, they translate that verse 27 as them yeah. rather than Him. Okay. But yeah. Because I do have an RSV, but it's just. Well, if you look oh, in the Bible yeah. Hub, the Bible Hub gives you different translations. I don't have that either, which is why oh, I'm using yeah, the, no worries, the worst. Yeah. Yeah. But I definitely need to learn Hebrew or Greek so I can probably understand That's what these things mean. Just try to the best of your ability. So, so as I yeah. mentioned, I'm trying to do it ground up, you know, so early church documents, church fathers, the original Greek, I'd rather go through that because I think people like Catholics and the, the Orthodox, they like to try and simplify church history. That's the issue I have. And simplify doctrine. It, yeah, yeah. They, they, they kind of they could jump in like feet deep because I have some friends who are Catholic, and I think they haven't really engaged with the ideas of Catholicism. They just jump straight into them and presuppose that these ideas have stayed consistent throughout the entirety of kind of apostolic history. So, like these translations, they have yeah. will serve and obey them. Good news as well. Um, serve and obey them. Okay. And this JPS Tanakh um, and obey them. So this is a Jewish translation of you of Daniel chapter seven verse twenty-seven. So most seem to have him, but um, otherwise it can also be translated yes. as them as well. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a Greek. No, this is Daniel seven twenty-seven. Yeah. So Daniel seven was written in Aramaic. But is it not referring to the Most High here? It says. The people oh. of the Most High, and then whose kingdom is so it's referring to the kingdom of the Most High. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I guess that. So that's and also all. A distinction, you know. So I, need, I need to look into it more deeply. So, okay, so like uh, in the Jewish translation, okay, shall be given yeah. to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their okay. th their kingdom is everlasting, and all dominions yeah. shall serve and obey them. Yeah. yeah, we need to look into the bigger, I guess. Otherwise, it's an over an oversimplification. You know? Uh, but yeah, in terms of Son of Man in the New Testament, um, the word Son of Man appears more times on Jesus' lips than the term Son of God. And sometimes when Jesus speaks about the Son of Man, he seems to be prophesizing about the future coming of a Son of Man. Uh, so I'll just show you one example. Uh, in Mark chapter 8, and it's the last verse. Um, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, in this adulterous, sinful generation, um, uh, um, adulterous generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed 
uh, when he comes in the glory of his, of his father with the holy angels. Yeah. So this seems to imply that the Son of Man hasn't yet come. Yeah. But when he comes, he shall also be ashamed of this adulterous sinful generation. Does Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man? Yeah, yeah he does, yeah. yeah. No, but, but, no, but, so, yeah. Coming, you know. but you know the word Son of Man? Um, yeah, yeah, so, so, so th this isn't speaking about second coming. Okay. This is saying when he comes, not when he returns. Okay. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying every time where this word Son of Man appears, it always means the same thing. It always refers to some future figure. Uh, but sometimes it does sound like, if you didn't already think that Jesus is the Son of Man, you would think that he's speaking about someone else mm. other than him. Yeah. But yes, yeah, sometimes it's actually clear that Jesus is speaking about himself. Like he says, the foxes have their holes, the birds in the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Mm. So there it seems clear that he's speaking about himself. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the term Father being used to refer to, I don't know, you deem it Allah? Or yeah, yeah. Allah, so um, in the Old Testament, the Jews, they did call God Father, yes. although not that much often. There's only like three examples I can think of where God is referred to as the Father. Um, and in the New Testament, Jesus seems to be um, in the habit of um, calling God Father. Um, but it's more times it's in the later Gospels or in the future Gospels than in the Gospel of Mark. So, uh, you know, in Mark's Gospel, um, Jesus only very few times calls God Father, but he calls God God. No, but, so, um, but he does refer to God as Father. Yeah. But so what, what but do you think that's, is that, how, how does that relate to, to Islam? Well, you know, in some of the sayings of Jesus in Mark, where he calls God God, uh, it does seem like they were edited by future Gospels to call him my Father. Yeah. So like, um, you know, in Mark chapter 3, uh, Jesus says, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. But in Matthew chapter 12, the same saying, Jesus says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister and mother. So it's say, the same yeah, saying, but... Would you say that this verse, like, by itself, would, would that be contradictory to Islam because it refers to God as a father? I mean, the, the, well, one view is that the title Father uh, was abrogated. So yeah, just so not by itself, yeah. though, as you say. Oh, well, well, by Islam because it was co the word father got associated exclusively with Jesus' yeah. sonship. So because God is called father in Christianity, yeah. it implies that Jesus is the son of God, in like in an exclusive sense, yeah. sharing divinity. So it, it's so not to confuse people. Yeah. Um, that may be one of the reasons why the title father. Uh, is abrogated in yeah. Islam, but there's another title for God given in, is, in Islam. Uh, it's the title Rub, um, and Rub pho phonically sounds similar to the um, Aramaic word Abba or uh, yes. Ab, uh, and Rub has a very similar meaning to to Ab. Uh, Rub means like cherisher, uh, sustainer, provider. So even though Muslims don't call God Father, uh, however, the meaning does seem to be, be still present in Islam as you know, someone who provides, yeah. someone who cares for his uh, creation. Okay. But just from what I know, lots of Muslims don't like the idea of calling God the Father. Uh, because of the common misunderstanding yeah. associated with the word. Does the Quran but we accept the meaning, like the meaning. Um, Does the Quran, is the Quran against calling God the Father? Oh, that's because, a good question. Yeah, um, lots of what I get is, like, lots of my background knowledge on Islam comes from people referencing it. And often stuff, like David Ruth, for example. But mm. I, have my, my, I myself, I don't know the verses to refer to these things. Mm. So there is a verse that some people bring up in chapter 5 of the mm. Quran, uh, where um, it says something to the effect um, that they call themselves the sons of God, or the children of God. Uh, but then God says, say to them, uh, why does he punish you for your sins? Yeah. Um, so so that, that basically means um, like they believe that because they're the sons of God, um, they have like um, divine right to salvation. Yeah. 
Uh, but you know, the Quran is saying that no, that doesn't mean the ultimate right to salvation. Um, that you you can still be punished by God, like for your for your crimes. With your arguments, which I think are, they're very good because you clearly know a lot. But at the same time, uh, I'm like yeah. you, so I'm yeah. starting from somewhere. So. But at the same time, it presupposes lots of things within it. Kind of, it presupposes that some things have been abrogated when they don't fit in, and some <laughs> things are misinterpretations. And I find that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's quite yeah. hard to come uh -huh. to the same conclusion as you when most things cool. are kind of murky. You know? you know, if you want to call God Father, oh, hi, hey, Walikul Sam. In the same group, man. Uh, uh, Styles. Who? Styles, Styles. Styles. Which group? In the group, in our group. Oh, uh, uh, the Dawah group. Oh, uh, uh, Mustafa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Oh, okay, right? Alhamdulillah, yeah. Give my salam to the brothers, yeah. Can you hear me now? I was just going to show you the example. Um, yeah, of um, course. So, so in this one, Jesus says, uh, for whoever does the will of God, brother, and sister, mother. And this is in Mark, which is the earliest gospel. Uh, and in Matthew, um, Matthew chapter 12. Uh, Jesus says, for whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother, sister, mother. So it's the same saying, it's the same context. Uh, but the difference is that the word God has been replaced with my Father in heaven. So it does seem that over time, that Christians were in the habit of representing Jesus as, as calling God Father um, and calling Jesus the Son of God more times uh, in the future Gospels. Uh, are you still hanging? Are you still sticking around? Or I just have to do my prayers uh, for the time goes. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, from yeah. Another 20 minutes. Okay, cool, yeah. yeah. I'll just do my prayers and I'll come okay. back, yeah? How long is it going to take you? Um, I'll be about five minutes, yeah? Okay, I'll be somewhere No problem, yeah? Okay, yeah. cool. Okay.